Who here is a software developer? I have to say that's a bit of a leading question. I think that's most of you. Who here has ever written a login form? Keep your hands up if you enjoy writing login forms. Yeah, we don't like login forms. So um, I'm a software engineer. I've been a software engineer for about 20 years. I also talk really quickly. And despite the lights, I can actually see most of you. So if I talk too quickly, just wave your hand and tell me to slow down, because I'm quite happy to do that. Um, so I'm a software engineer um, since about 1999. Um, I'm a community, ad community advocate. I go to conferences and meetups, and I've run a couple of events as well. And in that time, I've met people who are also, like me, very interested in security and privacy. I've considered actually implanting silver foil under my scalp, so it's permanently like a permanent silver foil hat, so that people can't read my mind. Um, I think there might be a problem with aluminium going into the brain, I think, I don't know. Um, but these things all culminated then with me starting to work for Auth0 back in September last year. Um, so the long story short, if you don't want to write another login form, have a look at Auth0. But today I want to talk to you about not having passwords, so how to forget passwords altogether. We, um, we come from a, a world where passwords are the primary form of credentials, the username or password kind of login system. And if we have a look at how that, um, oh, the other kind of login systems that we, we're probably also familiar with um, is linking into some kind of enterprise directory, AD, uh, ADFS, things like that. Um, social logins, so you just click on the Google link and you log in automatically. Automatically. Uh, client certificates, probably not so popular because they're a bit trickier to set up as a user, but a good way of, of uh, really ensuring that you know who's looking at your site and who they are and what kind of privileges to give them. Multi-factor authentication is becoming a lot more popular, especially with data breaches. Uh, passwords can essentially now be leaked, but it's still hard to log in. Um, and passwordless, which is kind of the next extension to that, which is what I'll go through today. But if we look at how these, where these all came from, every single login form is basically a user wants to get to a website, makes a request, and gets given a login form. And you type in your username and password, send it back to the server. The server then goes off to a database, and it says, can you find these credentials? database then returns a yes or a no, and if they're logged in correctly, they get the login page. So we're all familiar with that already. Um, that could also then obviously be Active Directory, as, as mentioned, or the client certificate where you don't even, even need a database as such. All you need to know is, is the certificate valid. You might still want a database for profile information, but you don't need it for login per se. Um, so multi-factor, I'm sure you're all aware, but I'll go into this anyway because that then steps into passwordless. Multi-factor, you've got your login form and you've submitted your details to the server and it pulls your uh, user details out of the database. But then rather than logging you straight in, it'll send you a second code of some sort to a, another device. It could be an email address or it could be a mobile phone via SMS. And then the user will submit that back to the server in order to complete that loop and then they're logged in. So that's how the multi-factor or what also used to be called two-factor authentication works. So if we take that model and we take the database out and we just provide a login form, if this login form only requires you to put in a mobile number, for example, then we can send a code directly to the phone and the user can supply that code and then they're logged in. So in this case, there's no password. The way that we know who they are is the fact that they were able to receive a code on their phone. You could also do that by email, send the code through. Or another way to do it would be through some kind of mobile app integration where you use push notifications to push a message out to a known login. Question then is how do you log into the application? It's another question. You could also do an email based password list with that if you liked. But then you can use the application to approve or deny. And you might have seen this with um, uh, at, at the very basic level. There's like the um, one time codes, the buttons you press when you log into your internet banking. Um, some banks are now going to the process where if you want to log into internet banking on your uh, desktop, they'll actually send a push notification to the app that you've got installed to verify that you want whoever's accessing internet banking to get in. Um, so in that way, you press yes, and that goes straight back. Um, no user involvement from the browser, but then the browser knows that it's logged in. <coughs> so what I actually wanted to do mostly was a demo, because they're much more fun, and they can also go horribly wrong. So let's just jump straight in. We've got over here, um, so I've just logged into my Auth0 panel up here. We've got um, the applications list there. I'm happy to go through this with anybody afterwards as well, if you want a bit more of an in-depth look. We've got a number of, ap of applications. I've created one down here for the demo today. And essentially, the main pieces that we need is the client ID, 
um, and the domain, so these two items here. So if we jump over and have a look at the code. So essentially, is that readable at the back? Are the colors okay? Yep, yeah, good. Um, so essentially, we've got um, a bit of code here. At the top there, we pull out the passwordless authentication hook um, method, and we pass into it. The purple bits might be a bit hard to see, but the first part is that client ID, and the second part is the domain. So this is essentially telling our application which identity provider we're using to log in, and what our ID is, so the identity provider knows um, which tenant, so a tenant is like a, uh, a subset of applications within one identity provider, which tenant we're logging into, so it knows which usernames to look for, or what kind of login mechanisms are allowed, and uh, what applications are allowed to use that. So we've also got down here a redirect URL, uh, which is what happens after the person logs in. And if we have a quick look at the application settings, we can see here uh, that we have the allowed callback URL to match the URL of the application we're running. So we've now got a system where you can uh, launch a login uh, form, which is based on the tenant within this Auth0 dashboard. And because the application is authorized within this system here, to get the callback, we can now send the, um, the identity token and the access token back to the application. So let's jump over to the actual application. I'm running this in a private browser just so that I'm not actually logged in yet. Um, so just having a quick look at the HTML again, at the bottom we've just got a login button. That's all we really need. So when we click the login button, it's um, going to take us through the login process. You can see also in the unauthenticated portion in the middle there, that when the result comes back, we're going to log that to the console, just so we can see what's going on, and also disable the login button, because obviously at that point we're logged in. And then we'll see what we can do with that information in the console. So if we just jump over to our users over here, I'm just going to delete my original user so that I can show the login, uh, the account creation process. find it. There it is. All right. So, forbidden, I need to log in again. This is what happens when you uh, wait um, for more than half an hour and you get logged out of a system, but you can still see the web page, which is always fun. So because that's taking well, too much time, let's just ignore that. So what I would want, want to show you here at this point um, is that when the account doesn't exist, uh, we can still create. So in this case here, because it's passwordless, we don't actually need a login form and a sign-up form. All we need is a form that asks for, in this case, a phone number. It could be uh, an email address. So I'm going to come in here and put in my phone number. Now, I was going to hook this up so you could see it on the screen, um, but my sister's been texting me about the wild night she had last night, and my wife is texting me YouTube links, so I thought it was probably better not to share that with all of you. Um, but instead, what I'll do is I'll just type this code in. So, 869, this has just come through immediately via SMS, 746. And once we submit, we get back to our original application. And we can see on the right-hand side here now we have a number of tokens. So the login button has been grayed out because obviously we're logged in. If we grab one of these tokens, like the ID token here, uh, jwt.io is a great tool for looking at JSON Web Tokens. Is anybody not familiar with JSON Web Tokens? So JSON Web Token is essentially, um, I'll show you what it looks like in fact. Um, it's essentially a base64 URL encoded set of information which contains a header, a payload, and a signature. So this is, the pay, this is the token that just got passed in after I logged in. And you can see we've got a header, the, the header type. The header type is JSON Web Token. And I find this really curious because the JSON Web Token is telling me it's a JSON Web Token. But in order to know that, I need to assume it's a JSON Web Token. So I don't know whether the type will ever be anything other than JSON Web Token. Is it is, if it is, I don't know what we're going to do with that information. But we, have, we know it's a JSON Web Token. We're now doubly sure it's a JSON Web Token. Uh, we've got an algorithm. So I mentioned, and we'll see it in a second, a signature at the end. There's two ways of creating that signature. Um, one of them is an HMAC signature, and the other one is, a, is an RSA signature. Both of them are using 256-bit uh, keys. 
And then we have the payload. So the payload here is just basically a JSON object, and it's passing through the information that it knows about me. So we can see at the top my phone number, um, and you can see a picture. So the picture there at the moment is just a, a placeholder photo that Auth0 has put in because I've just created my account. But if you did something, um, and that's outside of the talk of like passwordless, but if you did a Google login, for example, the picture that comes back would be your Google profile image. So we get all that information back through the Auth0 interface. Um, and then we have some standard information like the issuer, uh, the subject. So the subject is a reference to me. Every time I log in in the future, this subject value will always be returned so that you as the application developer can be sure that I'm the same person and you can use that as the identifier within your database to map it against your profile. We've got an audience, which is basically uh, the definition of what third-party systems can use this information. Because this is an ID token, it's not a JSON web token, uh, it's not a, a URL rather. If you look at the access token later, so the access token is the token you get back that you can then provide as a header to the call to an API. So the API knows I'm acting on Ben's behalf for this application. So that will actually contain a bit more information. Um, when it was issued, when it expires. And then down here we have the signature. So if I grabbed the um, public key from Auth0's interface, I would be able to paste that into this box. And it would show us at the bottom valid signature, but I don't have it handy at the moment. But essentially this part here verifies that the JSON web token hasn't been tampered with. Now the important part of this is that the JSON web token payload contains information that you're relying on as an application developer to create a profile. And you want to make sure that it hasn't been tampered with. Because the JSON web token is just base64 URL encoded, it's not actually encrypted. So by, using, by knowing the private key, or the public key, either way, you can verify the signature which your application will then contain. This means your application doesn't even need to talk to the identity provider to verify the token. The token verifies itself, which is kind of a neat little way of passing tokens around. So that's what a JSON web token is. So these get passed in here. Um, the access token, um, as I said, will give you access to the API. So once you have this information, um, we've done passwordless authentication. You don't need a username and password while you have a, a, a phone number. Um, current recommendations are, uh, so this is a single page app. Obviously, if you're doing a, a server to server uh, login, so you've got like a Python backend and a web front end, um, your Python system would be able to talk to Auth0 in order to make verification of the tokens. But in a single page app, as we have here, that's not going to be possible. So just as a little bit of extra information, there was uh, a finding probably about four or five months ago. People were storing them in local, uh, in local storage, which was the recommendation. That's no longer the recommendation because local storage can actually be uh, inspected by uh, other applications in other tabs, um, especially with cross-site scripting and injection attacks. So don't store it in local storage anymore. Take your tokens in your single page app and store them just in memory, which means that when you refresh the page, you're essentially logged out. But the way we solve that is a story for another day. So just to wrap up, go through the pros and cons. So one of the things that I really like about um, not having passwords is having worked in sort of support type spaces where people phone up and say, I've forgotten my password, can you do a password reset? I don't know which email address I used. Um, there's a lot of support weight on managing passwords and users' ability to log in. By going passwordless, if you say, I need your phone number, most people's phone numbers don't change and most people only have one. Therefore, it's easy for them to log in. Same for email addresses. A lot of us might have multiple email addresses. We might have a work one and a, a joint family one and a personal one. And a, I don't know some of us have probably got dozens of email addresses. But most of the time, we'll remember which email address we logged into a certain system with because if it's a work-related product, I'll use my work email. Um, Magic Link is another great way of doing it. Who here does, who here does not use Slack? <laughs> who here uses Slack? So you know when you log in sometimes now, you can actually get a magic link, which means you don't even need your password. And then you click on it, and it'll open up Slack and show you all your uh, accounts you're logged into in, in one place. So magic links are a great way of doing that as well. Um, and my personal favorite in terms of security is the native app integration. So if you can get your app to accept push notifications and use that as the passwordless authentication method, then you've really got good um, confidence that the person who's logging in has access to a device that you have good confidence they own. Now, the downside to the code, if we look at the cons, um, SMS, network ne uh, SMS network vulnerabilities are a thing. 
So I think it was about three years ago, two or three years ago, there were some researchers in the US who found that, um, I think it's called the S7 network. It's basically the underlying um, network technology used for transmitting SMSs um, all around the world. It actually has a vulnerability in that you can um, force it to modify and intercept information uh, in, in real time. So if somebody had access to this S7 network within the region that you're logging in or your customers are logging in, they could essentially grab the SMS and not only uh, intercept the information but also send false information on. So it's kind of like a man in the middle attack, uh, only worse in a way. So if you're relying on this as either multi-factor or an only factor of authentication, um, have a real think about whether SMS is secure enough for your, your purposes. The other downside is I can remember a username and password, especially if I'm um, one of those sensible people that has the same password for everything. That's, that's a really useful way of always being able to log in. There's not enough laughs for that one. <laughs> same password for everything? Is that normal? Oh, good. I, um, I hope not. But <laughs> if you're doing multi-factor authentication, you're going to need to have real-time access to your email if you're getting an email link, or to your phone if you're getting, getting an SMS. So there is a downside in that. Um, if any of you travel a lot, you might find that if you're in another country and you can't get an SMS, you're essentially locked out of all the systems you need. So again, passwordless is great, but have a think about your users' use cases, where they're going to be, how they're going to use it, whether it works or not. Sometimes username and passwords or um, a social login like going through Google or Twitter is good. Sometimes passwordless is good. There's no right or wrong. But next time you start a new project, consider this as an alternative way of uh, authenticating your users. That's pretty much it for today. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, but uh, And also, if you want to come talk to me about other Auth0 products as well. Um, thanks for having me. I hope it was informative. And uh, enjoy the rest of the, the conference. Thanks. <laughs>